You're listening to the Study Legal English podcast, the world's first legal English podcast, helping lawyers and law students become fluent in legal English. Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I am Louise, your host, and today I've got a very special guest on the show. Many of you listeners out there love watching criminal dramas. The Good Wife, Suits, Better Call Saul, Law and Order, Boston Legal, Silk, Judge John Deed, the list goes on. Why do you love them? They're exciting, they're sexy, and of course, the most important reason, you get to learn legal English, of course. Well, today I'm really pleased to have a real-life criminal defence barrister on the show. My guest was called to the bar in 1992 by Middle Temple. Middle Temple is one of the ancient four inns of court in London, which is entitled to call members to the bar, which for those of you out there who don't know what that means, it means to sort of officially make a person a barrister. Subsequently, he worked in different chambers, chambers being places where barristers work. And... He was a founding member of the specialist criminal set Garden Square Chambers. He has more than 20 years experience prosecuting and defending all kinds of criminal cases. And we're not just talking petty crimes or summary only offences here. He has worked as a CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, grade four prosecutor. That's the highest level reserved for barristers to prosecute the most serious of crimes, indictable offences. So we're talking murder, manslaughter, crimes related to firearms, gang violence, complex fraud cases, and major drug offences. All the kinds of things that you see on TV, this guy has dealt with in reality. And... I discovered this person via his brilliant website, www.defence-barrister.co.uk, because this provides information about criminal proceedings, and I was looking for that exact information whilst researching some subjects for this podcast. So, who is the special guest? It's Christopher Kesling, criminal barrister superstar. Christopher, thank you for coming on the show. Well, it's a pleasure, Louise. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And it, it's, I must say, delightful to be called a superstar. I, I, <laughs> it's not a word I would use, but, but thank you anyway. Brilliant. So today we're going to talk about some of the differences between what you see on TV and legal dramas and the reality, at least with regards to the English legal system. So first of all, Chris, what's with all the gavels everywhere? Can you explain what a gavel is and if they're actually used in reality. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting in your introduction, Louise, that you were talking about um, various shows, particularly on Netflix and the like, Better Call Saul, etc., all of which I love. I, I hasten to add, I think they're wonderful shows. But they do not always reflect the uh, reality. And on my uh, Defence Barrister website, I use this example of, of gavels because it is one of those areas there very often when you see uh, an image that's used to reflect anything to do with barristers that has a gavel on it and in fact wholly erroneously because gavels aren't used in the courts of England and, and Wales. A gavel is just a little wooden hammer. Principally gavels are used in auctions. You'll see them used there an awful lot and they're also used in the United States. A lot of courts in the US have them but in the English jurisdiction they're not used at all and I think it's just something that people relate to the court system. But the reality and of course I think as barristers we always need to tell ourselves this most people actually don't have any real experience or any meaningful experience of going to court that's a good thing i mean most people don't want to have to go to court even though courts can be very interesting places as an observer to go along and just watch proceedings generally but anyone that did would realize straight away that gavels simply don't happen they're simply a way of effectively calling the masses to order by banging on the on the table but no they are certainly not there and as I say I use this as an example on my website of the sort of thing where you may have an anticipation of seeing something but actually uh, that doesn't happen at all. 
Was there any point in history in the United Kingdom when gavels were used? Well, I'm not a, <laughs> an expert on the gavel, I must say. I don't, to my knowledge, no. I mm-hmm. think that gavels have never had a part to play. Mm. I mean, it's interesting. There's a lot of shows on television. I don't know how many of your listeners have ever watched on UK TV something called Judge Rinder. Mm. I mean, even Judge Rinder doesn't use a, a gavel, but he does have his courtroom set up very much in a US style. Yes. Um, and again, that's not reflective of what you'd ever see any of the UK courts set up. Like most people actually are quite disappointed when they go along to court. There's some wonderful old style courts, particularly in the the Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey, mm. particularly courts in one and two there. You know, they are, I think, what most people would think of a proper Crown Court, mm, for example. Mm-hmm. But there's lots of very dull modern buildings which are used in courtrooms and actually, sadly enough, that is the general experience of a courtroom. You go up there and you feel thoroughly underwhelmed by what you see. I suppose people imagine that the English legal system is very archaic and that these courtrooms are all oak panels, but actually, yeah, very often they're like a modern classroom. <laughs> that, that's absolutely true. It's interesting because sometimes there's a very good reason to have a modern courtroom. For example, youth courts. Uh, mm. the, the whole idea there was that they're essentially the same as magistrates' courts, so a lower tier of courts. The whole idea is that they shouldn't be horribly scary places for young people. Yeah. Whereas I think a lot of lawyers feel that there should be something about the courtroom that actually makes you feel a little bit intimidated because of the authority uh, of what a whole concept represents. And yes. sometimes, however, uh, I think another problem is there's no secret about this. There's been lots of it in the press about this, and certainly in the. Uh, in England and Wales, a lot of the courtrooms aren't really being kept up to the standards they should be. And that's, mm. a, that's a funding issue for the government. But mm. again, mm. that's something that really needs to be uh, resolved. Yes, yeah. Another point that just springs to mind from your yes. earlier question is I'm talking about um, perceptions. I think there's another perception about language. I think people assume that the language that's used in the courtroom is going to be archaic, the word yes. being used. And again, there's real moves now to remove that archaic language, to try and bring the language into the 21st century. That's where we are now. So, for example, the removal of Latin phrases. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, a simple thing in crime, for example, in civil proceedings in England, if you need permission to appeal, it's called permission to appeal. Mm-hmm. In crime, it's called leave to appeal. It means exactly the same thing. But it's one of those things that's very easy for a general member of the public to think, what are they talking about, leave to appeal? They actually mean permission. So actually, increasingly, just simple things like that are being removed and there's trying to be an alignment across all of the sectors of the legal profession to use language that actually is aligned, number one, it's the same depending on whatever jurisdiction you're dealing with, but number two, it's meaningful to your average member of the public, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, it helps with access to justice. Removing the legal terminology makes the system easier to understand. Absolutely. I mean, that was very much in, in the forefront of my mind when I drafted the various pages of my website, defencebarrister.co.uk, that I was pitching it to an audience that weren't versed in the the real detail of the criminal law and courtroom procedure. Mm. And so it's quite an interesting thing for a lawyer to do, actually, to try and actually break down what we're used to and put into normal language. And I think, actually, it's a good technique for all lawyers to be able to put things in a straightforward way that, that everyone should understand. Yes. I- interestingly enough, uh, when one looks at barristers, our own code of conduct, which is involved in effectively what's called the Bar Standards Board Handbook, the Bar Standard Board being the regulator for barristers. One of the concepts there about really client care is to speak to clients in a language that they will understand. And really that's removing, I think, what a lot of people would consider the old-fashioned, extremely pompous barrister who may impress him or herself with their great use of language but actually it's meaningless to the person they're speaking to Mm. so there's got to be a connection there and and I think that's a very very smart and important move forward. And um, talking about the changes in criminal legal language that's used in the court system is that based on for example I know that in the 
civil courts, it's the civil procedure rules. Mm. Is there something equivalent? For there the is. Criminal? Absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah. the criminal procedure rules. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so. And the criminal procedure rules, they work in, in quite a similar way. It, it's interesting because civil litigation founded on the civil procedure rules is a far more codified system in many ways than the criminal equivalent. But there are still criminal procedure rules, and they do set out precisely what the procedure is. In fact, Mm -hmm. the Court of Appeal in this country has been trying to drill into criminal practitioners. Look at these things. These are really, really important. In many ways, in the past, they've been pushed to one side. They didn't have the importance, certainly, that they now have. Mm. And therefore, there's been a real push to make sure that all criminal practitioners are on board with these. Mm. Uh, But nonetheless, we still have a, in many ways, a far more complex system. And it's quite interesting when law students are learning the civil procedure on the one hand and criminal procedure on the other, that some people naturally fall into the more codified concept of civil procedure and really struggle with criminal procedure, which even though we do have the criminal procedure rules, is a far more complex system in mm. some ways. Not that, It's not that the law's more complex, it's just the way that it's come together is more complex, and therefore there's still a lot of room to further codify the criminal law, and I suspect over the next 10 or so years we'll certainly see an awful lot more of that. Mm-mm-mm. So staying on the language aspects, yeah. um, in TV, very often you get barristers or the lawyers saying, objection, objection, Your Honour. Uh, have you ever heard that in a court? What's it like in reality? I've, I've, I've never heard it in a court, ever. Again, this is very much an American thing. It's quite interesting, if anyone ever does any teaching, and I've done some teaching of law students, you realise that a number of them, actually, the genesis of their interest in law was watching legal dramas. Great, that's absolutely fantastic. But if you analyse it, the majority of legal dramas, indeed the ones that you mentioned, are American. So an awful lot of the stuff that people are watching is based on the American legal system. Now, I have been to a few courts in America, and it is a very, very different system to the one that we, we operate in all manner of ways. But the example you give is a really good one, where you do have lawyers effectively talking over each other, shouting objection from both sides um, and the judge saying sustained or overruled. We don't get any of that in our court system. The courts of England and Wales, we have a more restrained system. And what you'll see in an English court, for example, if one advocate is getting rather upset with what another advocate's saying, you'll see them probably, first of all, shaking their head and getting a little bit ruffled about the whole thing in a very English way, and then standing up and saying something along the lines of, uh, Your Honour, I, I do apologise, but, but I, I do feel I must uh, stand up. And, uh, and uh, at this particular stage, perhaps a, a matter of law arises and perhaps we can discuss that, in the absence, of course, of the jury. Because in, it's certainly in criminal courts, in the Crown Court, all... Um, Legal matters have to be dealt with in the absence of the jury. So the jury then have to be sent out and then there's a legal, legal submissions are given, the judge will rule on those and then the jury will be brought back in. So it's irritating for a poor old jury because consistently they're sent out, brought back in, sent out, brought back in while the barristers have this fight. But it's far more restrained, a little more gentrified in some yes. ways than you might see in the American courts very- where it's far more full on. Very apologetic. Oh, the, very the much British so. are always very apologetic. And, and you'll see that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an excellent point. And, and anyone that, that's not from England notices that people say sorry all the time, um, even when they're doing you a favour. Yes. Sorry, could I just interrupt you? Sorry, could I just give you this? Yes. Um, sorry, you just trod on my foot. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> sorry for getting in your way. You're absolutely right. It, it, it is ingrained in the culture here to, to be like that. And so you get that very much coming across in general courtroom discussion. And the, the language of the courtroom Actually, there's a real push at the moment to make language more natural than it's, it's been before. There's a number of judgments from the Court of Appeal. The judges have said, you know, you don't have to say my lord in every single sentence or your lordship or my, my ladyship, your ladyship in every single sentence. Just 
park that and let's just get to the nitty gritty. What's this case actually about? Mm. And um, but yeah, going back to the original point about the apologies, you do see that, and therefore people don't like to object to each other. But the reality is also based on a system where there's got to be a very very good reason to object. Firstly, we do have a useful system where, uh, as I say, in a Crown Court, the jury are removed from legal arguments. So if there is a matter of law, it's understood by advocates that that is the system. Uh, So therefore, they shouldn't be swayed by matters that don't concern them. And the judge will take control of a case to ensure that he actually hears from each advocate individually and it doesn't become a shouting match Mm. where, you know, the poor old stenographer, for example, is desperately trying to work out who's saying what, not that stenographers are disappearing now, we're just pretty much on the... Exactly, yeah, (laughs) and and recordings, audio recordings. But nonetheless, judges still like some order in the courtroom. So, Mm. again, I think we're probably somewhat more ordered. I have met, in fact, a number of North American lawyers, US lawyers that have come in the past, and they always say in many ways how cute the English are and how restrained they are and mm-hmm. you know that it is a very, very different system to the one they operate in, which is far more full on mm. in your face, if you like, than yes. the than the English system is. But again things are changing a little bit, but nonetheless that's still the system that's in operation here. Good. And um what about something like again, something else we might see in a legal drama would be a lawyer saying, May I approach the bench? Have you ever heard of that before? Well, again, all of these things, it's really interesting because when we have a lawyer in the US saying, may I approach the bench, what the lawyer is actually saying is, there's a matter of law I'd like to discuss with you, but I don't want them, the jury, to overhear what it is. So we're going to come up, stand in front of you and whisper to you if that's okay. Again, our system is far more stratified in the sense that we say, matter of law members of the jury, time for you to leave, Mm -hmm. have a cup of tea, whatever, um, and then come back in. And a judge will actually say to a jury at the outset of a case so that they don't keep wondering what's going on, members of the jury, during the course of this particular case, there will be a number of legal submissions, and such is the nature of your task that these are matters for me, the judge, and not matters for you. So when counsel mentions a matter of law, they're not being difficult with you. It's simply a, a cue to me to ask you to leave so I can deal with that legal argument. Uh, and that's exactly what will happen. So mm. the English equivalent of saying, may I approach the bench, is to say, Your Honour, uh, at this particular stage, as a matter of law. The judge will then turn to the jury and say, members of the jury, as you know, convenient time for lunch or convenient time, another convenient time for a cup of tea. tea. Absolutely. They'll be thinking it's my 15th cup of tea for the day. (laughs) I don't want to do this again. Uh, But uh, off they'll go. Then there'll be a matter of law. The jury then will be brought back in. The judge will rule on that matter of law. If it doesn't have any impact on the jury, the judge won't say anything to the jury about it. If it does have an impact, then the judge will deal with the jury as far as, as that's concerned. Mm-hmm. So that's the way we do it. It's a more formalised concept, if you like, but it's actually, to my mind, more efficient. It stops this consistent objection over rules sustained. It stops people running up in front of the jury and then wondering what's being discussed and why can't we hear about it. It's explained to them from the outset, as I say, so they know what the deal is and it works absolutely fine. So, uh, yes, but we don't have... I've never actually heard anyone say my approach to the bench. What I can say, in uh, and I've done quite a lot of advocacy teaching, both to professionals and to students... Students consistently say, may I approach the bench, because that's their understanding of how our system works. And it takes a while for them to realise, no, that's the US system, it's not the English system. And um, moving on to some of the process that happens in court, what's the difference between a TV cross-examination and one in reality? Well, I mean, it's quite an interesting point. I think what a lot of people realise when they come into a real courtroom is actually it's quite slow progress for all manner of reasons. Things have undoubtedly they've got better. But in the past, advocates would always be told to watch the judge's pen. So to ask a question, uh, watch the judge's pen, and there would, there would be the judge writing it down, um, not quite with an old-fashioned quill pen, but something <laughs> along those lines, then... 
the witness would answer and the judge again would scroll out the answer and often if you started asking another question the judge would put a hand up look at you gruffly as if you haven't been watching my pen that in itself could actually slow things down Obviously, now we all have laptops, we all have computers, and a lot of judges, not all of them, but a lot of judges are quite good at typing quite quickly so they can keep up Mm -hmm. with what's going on. But certainly, if you're watching the television, to make it theatrical, to make it interesting, to keep your interest, it's got to move at speed. And it's a speed that you rarely ever get in a real-life courtroom where the jurors obviously have also really got to take into account the absolute detail of everything that's said. I think another thing that's really important, because you're dealing with a, a jury in the Crown Court, and you've got a, you don't know who you're dealing with on a jury. Obviously, you don't know any of these people. Mm. The, the jurors are brought in, you know, they receive their jury summons, they're brought in. They probably don't really want to be there. Yeah, they find it interesting, but you know they have a hundred other things, their children, their work, whatever it might be to deal with. And you don't know what the people are like, what their, their general level of intelligence is, for example. We, we just don't know. All of these things we don't know. So you've got to pitch things to a jury you know, in the middle to ensure that everyone is going to get the point. And sometimes that can mean asking a number of questions on a particular issue, just so there's absolute clarity on that point. Again, you don't really have to do that with a TV audience. You don't have to go over stuff again and again and again. I'm not saying that in real life you the repetition kills the point off. That would be bad advocacy. But you do need to ensure that the point is absolutely clear and of course on television it's all going to be scripted and a witness is always going to answer with clarity they're not going to go um uh um well i'm having a bit of trouble remembering Mm. that in real courtrooms that's what you get and so you have to sometimes go through you know a memory refreshing procedure where you uh, refer them to their statement and um ask them to read a certain part of their statement and then ask them the question again you're never going to get that on TV because it would be boring so actually it's just one example of of the difference between the two TV is written for it to be really really interesting um, and dramatic and actually real life cases aren't always dramatic they can be another thing that really springs to mind of course often you get in TV dramas the defendant or a witness there and saying yes yes you're right I'm lying you know they put their hands up you know I can think of probably two or three cases in over 20 years as a barrister where I've actually seen someone on the witness stand under oath admit that they were lying. It may be perfectly obvious that they are lying. You may have a wealth of material in cross-examination to put to them which really demonstrates very, very clearly that they are lying. But Will they admit it? That That is incredibly rare. Whereas in a drama, to make it a real drama, to have them collapsing and crying and saying, yes, you're right, I made it all up, that's drama. It's very rarely real life. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the pace of proceedings and certainly the inevitable admission of guilt in the witness box in the dock, that's something you don't see in, in, in real life. What about, it? often in television dramas... The lawyer who's questioning the witness is kind of trying to trip them up. Is that the same in reality? Well, I mean, it depends which side you're on. I mean, if you're prosecuting a case, for example, you will call your first witness, and that's called examination in chief. So examination in chief is simply about eliciting the detail of that witness's case. Uh, So there's no concept of tripping them up. In fact, you want to make it absolutely clear what side you're on. Because Mm. if they think your own, if you like, not your own barrister, because if you're prosecuting, you don't actually represent the person. You represent, in this country, the Crown. Mm. For Regina, so that's why all cases are R with a V and whoever the defendant Mm -hmm. is. So... In that situation, you're prosecuting, you're taking through their evidence in chief, you're just trying to elicit essentially what would already be contained in a written statement that you as the barrister would have in front of you. The jury wouldn't get that statement. So you're just trying to get that detail across to the jury and you're certainly not trying to trip them up. 
When you are uh, cross-examining, so you know, you're now moving over to the defence side, for example, in this scenario, that same witness, you will now, now it's time for cross-examination. There's a number of concepts of cross-examination. The key concept in cross-examination is to put your client's case. Hmm. So the witness has said, I was walking down the road, for example, and someone, Chris Kessling, came over and punched me in the face. If someone's representing me and I'm the defendant, Chris Kessling, I might say, no, it wasn't like that. Uh, You came over to me, you tried to punch me, and I punched you in self-defence. That's actually what happened here. So that's my version of events. Mm -hmm. So that's the version that the defence barrister, my barrister in that situation, would have to put to the witness. That's the first concept of cross-examination called putting your case. The second part of cross-examination is undermining the witness. So you have to look at what evidence you have that would allow you to undermine the witness. So let's say, in that scenario, uh, as soon as the police were called, the person was spoken to by the police and said that I'd come over the road and and hit them, but actually the police had then spoken to someone else at the scene who said, I know Chris Kessling, he he was walking down the road, I saw someone run over the road and try and punch him. Uh, And Chris just responded, trying to protect himself. Obviously, that would be put in cross-examination to undermine the credibility of that witness's version of events. And there could be all manner of material available to the defence that might undermine the credibility. It could be what another witness says. It could be, for example, that the witness has numerous previous convictions for perverting the course of justice. And Mm -hmm. therefore, the defence may say... Frankly, they're not a credible witness. They've lied so many times before that you could never believe them now. So they'll put my version of events, they'll put this material that would undermine the witness, and then once that's done, and all the witnesses in the case have been called, it would be up to my barrister to stand there on my behalf and actually effectively put all of this before the jury to say, look, this is what we say happened. Can you be sure that that's not the case? Because that's the burden of standard mm. proof. Burdens on the prosecution to prove that I'm guilty and to a very high standard. You've got to be satisfied so that they are sure of my guilt. And then, of course, my barrister would be relating all of this detail that actually shows that this person's a liar. They've lied on numerous occasions before. In fact, another person saw what happened. It's completely different to what this witness says. And therefore, we say that the defend- that Chris Kessling in this particular case is not guilty. And we ask that to be your verdict. So that's essentially how the system works. So much slower calmer and perhaps more thorough than we see on television. Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways where you do get drama in an English court is exactly what I've been talking about just then, the closing speech. In many ways, uh, the, uh, an opening speech for the prosecution and a closing speech for the prosecution and particularly a closing speech for the defence are probably the most dramatic things that, that barristers have to do within a trial concept. And it is a skill that you hone and pick up. When you're a junior barrister, you go, you go to case all the time and you listen to what other barristers do. And you think, oh, I really like the way that this person said this and I really like the way that they said that. And you use all this to develop your style. And every barrister has an individual style, a style that's unique to them. But often it's taken, that little parts of it are taken from just their wealth of experience of watching lots of other barristers do their job. And in many ways, I think that's one of the beauties of legal education in this country, that the way it works is that no barrister is ever going to go and do a case until he or she has had, during their pupillage, uh, i.e. their work experience, if you like, a lot of opportunities Mm. to go to court and really experience um, what other barristers are doing and that's really what starts to make you a worthwhile advocate and necessarily over the years you get better and better and better at doing that and so to hear a really good barrister do a closing speech on behalf of a defendant for example can be a really amazing thing another interesting area to watch a barrister would be a plea in mitigation where someone has been found guilty or pleaded guilty to an offence 
and um, the prosecution have opened their case to the judge and now it's the turn of the defence barrister really to put forward all of those matters that lessen the seriousness of the offence, i.e. that mitigate the offence. That's the, that's the plea in mitigation. And again, that really calls on a, a lot of experience and a very careful use of words where you don't want to wind the judge up to irritate the judge too much on the one hand, but you've really got to get across to the judge why, for example, my client should not go to prison. That's usually what clients don't want, Mm. to go to prison. So that's usually the key issue in the case. Uh, Or sometimes if you know that it's such a serious matter that there's always going to be a custodial sentence to follow to actually you know, lessen the number of years that someone's going to go away for. And that could be very, very difficult, you know, particularly if you're dealing with someone who is vulnerable or someone who is particularly young. Um, again, these you know, you've got all the family in court, and sometimes the family from both sides. So very, very difficult cases. One of the most difficult things I think a lot of barristers deal with a death by a dangerous driving case, for example, yeah. where you know someone's lost a member of their family. They are going to very often perceive that like a murder. Yesterday I had a son, today I don't have a son, because you were driving your car at 60 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone and you knocked them over. Whereas the person who's in the dock for death by dangerous driving would be thinking, I don't know what happened, Um, it it was an accident, I didn't realise what speed I was going, whatever it, it might be. I just didn't want this to happen, I can't believe it has, I'm I'm desolate at what has happened. I, do, I can never forgive myself. So you have these real extremes. And, and as a barrister, you've got to try and work a middle ground, which can be incredibly difficult. So you've mm. got to recognise the seriousness of the offence um, for the court and, of course, for everyone in the courtroom. Uh, by the same token, you have got to put forward the mitigation on behalf of your client that this isn't a murder case. Mm. It's not charged as a murder case. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it shouldn't be dealt with as a, as a murder case. But you've got to pitch it in a way that's going to be and use language that's going to be acceptable to the judge and, you hope, not cause too much of an uproar in the public gallery at the same time. Mm. And there can be a lot of, therefore, competing matters that a, a barrister has to do. And that's just one example. Do you have time to prepare that closing speech or do you just have to do it on the spot? That's a really good question. It depends really where you are on the day. I often used to really like it when the the judge said, yeah, we've got time for speeches, let's get on with it. Now, the reality is, if you've imbued yourself in the detail of a case, you know the case well enough to make a closing speech. And, And if it came at you as a bit of a surprise, you could probably say to the judge, Your Honour, I do apologise, but I, um, could you please grant me some time to prepare this? The reality is most barristers would have prepared it the night before, and sometimes a judge will um, say, let's have speeches the following morning, recognising that there might be an awful lot of, for the barristers to do. So you don't find yourself in a situation with barristers unprepared to make their speeches. Yeah, but I actually personally quite liked suddenly being asked to make my speech, because I think... To make a good speech, you really need to focus, not to have any form of script, just to stand there, to look at the jury, to think about the case, and to make the key points on behalf of your client. It, that's a skill, um, again, as I say, it's something you hone over time. But I think sometimes when you do it off the cuff, it sounds quite odd, but actually it really allows you to think about the really important and key aspects of your case. And I felt sometimes it was very, very good to do that. Mm. But yeah, there's been plenty of times where I, like any barrister, have been up till two, three, sometimes four o'clock in the morning working on a very, very detailed case. And again, it depends on the complexity of the case you might be dealing with. But you are thinking about all of the points that are against you and what you can say to the jury effectively to lessen the strength that they have, lessen their impact. Mm. That's really the key of the closing speech and that can take an awfully long time. And sometimes you're thinking, you know, this case is overwhelming, what can I do? Yes. Um, but you do realise after some time that really you're never dead in front of a jury. There is the burden of standard proof. Uh, you don't have to prove for a defendant that you're innocent. They, the prosecution, have to prove that you are guilty. Mm. And it's very, very important not to try and twist that 
uh, and say to the, the, the jury, well, you can be sure that this person's innocent. That's, that's missing the point. Mm. It's about, can you be sure that they're guilty? Yeah. And once you really understand that, then you realise, okay, what can we do to influence the jury, correctly of course, with the evidence in this case, to create enough doubt for them to find the defendant not mm-hmm. guilty. And again, it takes a lot of time, but yeah, that's a really important key, mm-hmm. key point for any barrister. I guess this is, some, some of the listeners who listen to the podcast, you know, sometimes they're confused between the barrister and the solicitor, but I mean that, you've just highlighted that that's one of the key skills that a barrister needs to have, yeah. is this absolute you know, clarity and communication and the ability to condense a lot of information and argue with um, uh, with something that I clearly can't do. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I mean, it's an interesting point about barristers and solicitors because traditionally barristers worked in the Crown Courts, they were the advocates and solicitors, criminal solicitors, worked in the magistrate's court and they had far more contact with the client. There has been an alteration of that. It's right to say that barristers still are are primarily focused on advocacy, but there are a number of solicitors that do a very, very good job as advocates in the Crown Court. Mm. And um, now that solicitors can go into the Crown Court, they have a qualification to give them higher rights, higher rights advocates, they can go into the Crown Court and some of them are really, really very good at doing that particular job. And actually, solicitors can wear wigs as well and their gowns are quite similar to barristers. So your average person wouldn't often know the difference between a a barrister and a solicitor in any event. But there are some not so good solicitors, but then there are some not so good barristers. Um, But increasingly, I think what we're seeing is a a fusion of the two sides of the legal profession. Yes, barristers principally really know for their advice uh, and mainly for their advocacy. But again, there's a number of solicitors that actually have practices that are very, very similar to what one would think of in terms of your average barrister. Okay, we've discussed that on TV very often things are very strange and nothing like as we can see in reality, or they're very much more dramatic. But sometimes we do get things which happen in real life which are much stranger than on TV. For example, we had recently, if any of you are fans of suits out there, you'll know Rachel Zane, a paralegal in suits, married a lawyer, Michael Ross. Nothing strange there. But in reality, we had Meghan Markle, who was the actress who played in the show, the character Rachel Zane, marrying Prince Harry, which of course was like a bit like a fairy tale. So Chris, in your experience, have you come across things which in reality are actually much stranger than you've seen on TV? Well, I mean, undoubtedly, the, the, the interesting thing about being a barrister is that you each case in many ways is a window on someone's life. And sometimes it's a, a really quite amusing window. Other times it's desperately, desperately sad and, and, and sometimes horrific. It depends on the nature of the work that, that you, you do. Sometimes you really wonder how what you're dealing with could be possible because it's so awful. It's a sort of thing that you, could, you couldn't make it up. I think that's probably the best word for it. Sometimes, particularly in criminal work, you think you've seen it all and then another case comes along and you realise you haven't. And that's a continual concept. So you never quite know what's around the corner. And that's what makes the work very interesting. But also it's what makes the work sometimes very sad and very, very depressing. So you've got to find a way of disconnecting sometimes from from what you do. I think sometimes, you know, just in the way that the police investigate things can be extraordinary. And I can remember a case from, you know, the late 1990s, I think it was 1997, where there was uh, in Sheffield, so a little bit further north uh, from where we are in London to northern England, there was a case where the, the suspect was black. And they needed to do an identification procedure. Um, Identification procedures have changed a little bit more, and they're computer-operated now for most of of the time. But they didn't have that system then, so they needed to get a number of other people in the lineup 
um, who were black, but they couldn't find other black people for the lineup. You've got you couldn't just have a black person, the suspect, and lots of white people mm. because it would be very obvious mm-hmm. who the the suspect was. So the reality is, you needed a lineup full of black people, and the police, because they couldn't find black people in these circumstances, they actually got a professional makeup artist in. They got white people in, and they made them up to look like black people. Something that the judge called a farce when it got to court. Things like that. You'd think if you just told that story and it wasn't true, people would say, come on, you're making this up. But that actually happened. Um, It was dealt with in Sheffield Crown Court, as I say, I think in 1997. And uh, it won't surprise you that the judge booted that case out and said it wasn't going anywhere. Um, So there are extraordinary things that happen. I can't think of any more examples off the top of my head, but that is one very clear example of something that you'd certainly never see on television and uh, again because people wouldn't believe it people wouldn't believe anything as stupid as that could ever actually happen so there you are so that brings us to the end of the podcast episode so thank you very much thank you louise it's been a pleasure very very interesting and uh, for all you listeners out there if you're interested in criminal procedure take a look at chris's website defense-barrister.co.uk and that's defense d-e-f-e-n-c-e and have a look there's lots of information there Uh, you can find further information about the show at studylegalenglish.com so thank you for listening and see you next time